know. A little uh, just housekeeping items about microphones, bathrooms, Wi-Fi, and the such. So today, if you are one of the presenters, we will ask that you use the microphone as well. Um, even if that maybe makes you a little uncomfortable, but we're recording on Teams so that we can um, send this out to later for anyone who missed it, but it's the microphones that are capturing the sound in our room. So when we go to questions and answers, the congressional style <laughs> microphones at your, at your tables here are just sitting and um, when they're red, they're muted and when they're green, they're live. And um, you don't have to talk really loud, as you can tell, I'm using an indoor voice and my soft jazz radio voice. And um, so, uh, but you will probably have to move it around. It, it won't capture like two or three people away. So just pass the mic around. If you have a question, just raise your hand and then we'll, we'll make sure the mics get to you. So um, if you haven't already figured it out, D20 guest is the wire, wireless connection. And then um, you probably passed the restrooms when you came in. There's a couple that were just, if we go out to this next hallway and take a left, there are two there, men and women. Um, but then um, there are another set that has much more room. Um, if you continue straight down this hallway and take a right past the kitchenette, there's a couple of them. And also a water refill. We have water here, all the refreshment. Um, please help yourselves. That's what they're there for. Um, and then later we'll be having lunch brought in as well, and that will be a combination or like family meals from Panera. There's soup, salad, sandwiches, lots of different things to choose from depending on your, your appetite. And I will pass it off. All right. Um, so welcome. Uh, we have three different presentations today, so we're going to be looking at the NWEA map growth scores. Uh, and that's going to be Academy School District 20 that will be presenting on that. After that, we have our October count use case, and that will be Aurora Public Schools. Um, after those, we will then, um, I'm going to be doing a demo on dynamic zone visibility. Uh, and then Claire will have a uh, kind of a, a use case of where uh, Boulder, Boulder Valley School District is using that. Uh, and then we'll have lunch. Um, we are. Claire, I'll let you introduce yourself here in a moment. Uh, we're going to go around the room and introduce all of ourselves so we can practice using the mics and so we get to know you all. Um, as you introduce yourself, if you would just let us know who you are, uh, kind of your role, where you're coming from, and then what your favorite uh, Tableau functionality is at the moment, because I know it can change, or at least for me it changes, so I assume it probably changes for some of you. I'll go first, and then I'll pass it to Claire. Uh, my name is Ryan Allen. Like I said, I'm a manager at Plant Moran. I've uh, been working with Tableau now for four and a half years, something like that. Uh, and my favorite functionality at the moment, uh, I've been doing a lot with sets and set actions lately. Um, and so there's just some fun things that you can do with that that make your dashboard really schnazzy. So thanks. All right, thank you. Um, good morning, I'm Claire Sims. I'm the Senior Data Visualization Designer at Boulder Valley School District. So um, I really support Tableau dashboards and server for um, my academic team colleagues at the district, principals and teachers as well. Um, and my favorite Tableau functionality at the moment and in many moments, I feel like this is kind of a boring one, but it's such a workhorse, is containers on dashboards. Um, just love those, and I love the feature where you can um, like make the uh, sheets equal size within the container. So if you haven't tried that and are curious, let me know. Um, it's just something I use like almost every day when I'm in Tableau. All right, so I'll pass it to Holly, and you can also model using the mics. <laughs> Okay, so Holly Patterson, I am a senior uh, programmer analyst for District 20 in the IT department. And um, I mean, I don't want to be redundant, but I guess my favorite is the dynamic zone visibility. Um, it just helps free up the real estate that you have 
on a dashboard and swapping out sheets is kind of a pain, um, but um, that's my favorite. My name is Stephanie Malinero. I am a teacher on special assignment in the assessment department here in Academy District 20. Um, so I am not sure about a specific talent of functionality, but uh, we work closely with Holly um, and just really excited about the potential that um, Tableau has uh, created in our district, um, accessibility to data and information, um, both for our higher ups in the district, all the way down to teacher level. Um, so just how we're utilizing it, it's very exciting. And I am Michelle Even. I am also a teacher on special assignment for assessment. And again, I'm just an end user of the product, but appreciate very much all that you do to bring the data to life for us. My name is Brian Thompson. I'm a teacher on special assignment in curriculum and instruction here in District 20. So I work with all of these wonderful people. Um, again, I'm an end user. And so I just appreciate uh, the data that we can get to teachers and the functionality of it and the usability of Tableau that we have. Hi, I'm Becca Hansen, Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind. Um, and I don't have a favorite functionality. I'm still a beginner and learning, so I don't know all the cool functionalities yet. <laughs> and I'm a program assistant with curriculum instruction and assessment. I am Jenna Shimov. I'm with Littleton Public Schools. I'm a system administrator. And I love how you can connect Tableau to um, Infinite Campus with SQL so that information gets updated when um, it's updated in the database. Hi, I'm Kim Bennett. I'm with Adams 12 Five Star Schools. Um, my favorite function is I've been working a lot with sets, but also in the top N, we use that a lot um, for our schools and in our Tableau uh, dashboards. I'm Kevin Fraser. I'm the assessment manager for Littleton Public Schools and um, work on and off with Tableau, um, but SETS is also one of my favorites. Um, if anyone's ever tried to do um, cohort longitudinal data, SETS are the perfect way to do that. Um, I mean, if you want to do a true cohorts and trying to do that in Excel or something is really doesn't work well. So <laughs> I really appreciate that functionality. My name is Edwin. Um, I'm a data analyst for Aurora Public Schools. Um, my favorite functionality in Tableau is the Venn diagram joins. Just makes it quick and easy without having to write a SQL script. Yeah. I'm Chris Eggleston. I'm a database app developer here in Academy 20. And I think my favorite feature is uh, the geocoding and mapping functionality in Tableau. It's just always interesting to work with. My name is Amy McClagan, and I am the database manager for Cheyenne Mountain School District 12. And I am new at Tableau. Um, we don't have very many visits yet, but I'm looking forward to learning more. Hi, I'm Jen Weber. I'm a database application developer here in Academy District 20. Um, my favorite Tableau functionality is still probably Viz and Tooltip. It's an oldie but a goodie, and I use it a lot. <laughs> and I'm Matt Korea, uh, application specialist. Uh, up to like three weeks ago, I was just an end user, so oh. I don't really have like a favorite functionality yet, but excited to learn more. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah, application specialist here at D20. Uh, my favorite functionality is the quality warnings that they show up so that way I can look back at my data and see what would look wonky before I create something and present it to people and look like a total moron. So. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's kind of exciting to have a lot of end users here. Yeah, I 
that was just great to hear the variety um, of like from even like shaping your data, doing the joins, like that's a feature I love too. Um, different kinds of data with um, mapping and then just also some of the like day-to-day -day kind of features that we use around um, look and feel and calculation, but also the end user. Um, yeah, so I hope that today, you know, as an end user, you're like, it's easy to use, it's great. I see these like um, features that make my life easier. And so I hope that we can kind of pull back the curtain a little bit. Um, and so you can start to understand how that's built and um, just some of those features that you can also start to get familiar with and incorporate into your own visualizations as well. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, welcome, and I think, uh, I guess any celebrations or highlights for Tableau-related things? I know some of you went to Tableau conference. Um, anything like that? I passed my Tableau certification at conference. It was a lot harder than I was expecting. I do like Tableau pretty much every day, all day. So I was like, oh, I got this. And it was hard, <laughs> uh, but I passed it, so anything? All right, I will then um, pass it over. Um, just kind of as a quick heads up, after each of the presentations on each of the tables, we just have a list of kind of uh, questions for you to ponder, I like that word, but consider, you could even just answer them. Um, and we kind of would like for you to answer these kind of in your uh, table clumps or partner up with someone. Um, but these are really just questions that we have come up with to help take, uh, kind of take what you're seeing and just like push it a little bit deeper. So instead of this becoming just a presentation that I'm watching or seeing someone else's use case, trying to ask a question that takes it just a little bit deeper, um, adding a little bit more depth to it of like, how could I actually apply this to my district? Or, you know, what are some of the speed bumps at my current situation that would keep me from being able to do something like this. Um, my favorite one on here is that last one. That would said, uh, this would work in my district if, fill in the blank, or this would not work in my district because, and then try to try to help identify some of those either roadblocks or things that's like, ooh, like if this thing was in place, we'd have smooth sailing and we'd be able to do this. So um, feel free to look at those now if you want. Um, but we'll break after each one of those just to have some discussion time. Any questions or thoughts before we jump in? Great. All right. Holly. All right, welcome everybody. Um, we are excited to be here and get the opportunity to um, present some information to you. Uh, Holly and I will be going over um, a sunburst visualization on map growth to CMAS projected proficiency. Uh, so just a brief background as Holly is getting kind of set up on her side. Map growth is the benchmark or interim assessment that we use here in District 20. We are in our fourth year of implementation with this assessment. Um, and one of the neat things about map growth is that there is a Colorado linking study that's available out there for the world to see. Um, so if you just Google Colorado linking study for NWEA, um, I think it's about 30 pages long. Um, but what we've done is we've taken some of the information from that linking study uh, specifically the projected proficiency that it provides um, to see what is that correlation between map growth and CMAS here for our students in District 20. Um, and so one of the papers that we provided to you is an excerpt from that linking study. And so uh, as students take this assessment um, two or three times a year, it will provide in the system a projected proficiency on how they will do the, the following spring on our CMAS state assessment. Um, so that's kind of what we're gonna be going through with you today. 
um, and I'll be referencing this document and kind of showing you how to use that. And then I will be going under the hood and how we how we built the um, Sunverse chart and some of the other features on the dashboard the action filters that are engaged in there. So when that time comes. <laughs> So a lot of my role here in District 20 is um, working with staff and uh, administrators on uh, interpreting the data, analyzing the data, root causes. Uh, and so Holly and I work specifically very close together on developing visualizations uh, based off of needs and requests throughout our district. But we also work with other departments. Um, so Brian from Curriculum and Instruction, uh, is somebody who we partner with a lot. So kind of how this came about uh, with this project is Brian started digging deeper at the middle school level to say, what is the correlation if we're looking at math specifically for that projection that map growth provides? Um, are students on track for meeting that projection? Are they going to exceed or um, kind of you know surpass that? or are they not going to, to get to that projection? So uh, he kind of started this process, and then I worked with another colleague uh, in curriculum and instruction to brainstorm how we could look at this a little bit deeper. Um, so what we did is, again, looking at that Colorado linking study, um, we created the viz um, with Holly's help. So Holly came up with the Sunburst. So it's definitely been a collaborative effort among different departments. Um, to kind of get to this end result. So how do we communicate the results? Before we jump in and demo our visualization, we just wanted to kind of talk through this process. Um, and us being end users, a lot of the times, again, we're working with staff uh, specifically. So a couple of things that we've developed here in District 20 to help facilitate some of those conversations are principal data cycles. So we will bring in administrators at each level uh, four times a year, and we do data work with them, um, kind of like a district level professional learning community, if you're familiar with that, that terminology, um, but then also working with professional learning communities within our school. Another facet of that is we have a learning services department that we work with um, supporting our schools. So it's called a support to schools group. Schools can request specific um, help on these areas and we'll come out and do presentations and work with them, providing them protocols and things to really dig into what does the data mean and uh, why might we be getting the results that we're, that we're seeing. Okay. One of the things that this visualization has really done for us here in District 20 is it helps to build capacity and build the buy-in of that assessment and using the data to inform instruction and make those changes that are really going to impact um, student achievement and growth. So this is our visualization here. Um, and I know it's kind of small. Holly, are we able to zoom in a little bit? Control plus. Let's see. Perfect. A little better? That's perfect. Okay. Across the top here, we have some filters. Um, so you'll see on the left side, we have test year and roster year. Um, one functionality that we're hoping to add after having a little bit more data um, loaded in is to incorporate that roster year for um, the, the next year so that teachers could see how are students in my classroom. Um, what are their results from last year? So they can hit the ground running and kind of see um, which students met that projection, surpassed it, um, or outperformed it, or underperformed, and really kind of already targeting in, uh, their instruction from day one. We have an assessment school. So right now, it's, this is our district uh, overall, and this is an anonymized version um, that Holly has created. So we could choose a specific school And then we could also dig down to a specific grade level. Um, right now we're looking at math data specifically. And we can even narrow it by 
a specific teacher. If we look over here on the right hand side, we have our legends. So the top um, kind of line there represents our map growth test percentiles. Um, red represents students who are well below, orange is below, yellow is meets, green is above, and blue is well above. And that corresponds to this data here and also this data in this bar column um, under the map growth student details. Below that, we have our CMAS proficiency levels. Um, so if you've ever worked with CMAS data, you're probably familiar with these. Um, so we have did not meet, partially met, approached, met, and exceeded, which corresponds with this data here. And then we also have a line um, as we scroll. Uh, so you'll notice that those correspond with that information there. I'd like to take a moment just to um, kind of put this on, on a shelf for a second. Um, and let's focus here on the sunburst. Uh, so you can, you can see here that we have uh, green represents our students that matched or met that projection that Map Growth said that they would, they would on CMAS. Blue represents students that outperformed and gray represents students who underperformed that projection. A neat feature about this visualization is uh, it will break it up on the outside. You'll see uh, slightly different colors that represent third, fourth, and fifth graders um, as we're looking at one of our elementary schools. If we click in that center green, it's going to show me all students in third, fourth, and fifth grade, and you'll notice that the data on this side has changed. One of the reasons why we incorporated both math and map growth and CMAS data um, is because we realized that end users may be looking at uh, those data sets separately. So they may be coming here to say, let's look at CMAP or let's look at map growth, maybe not necessarily looking at them together. Another reason for doing that is to clarify misconceptions. So if you notice, our um, achievement ranges for percentiles for map growth do not necessarily exactly correspond with our proficiency ranges for CMS. So one of the really neat uh, dynamic pieces of this visualization is if you click on, let's say that nine percentile there, um, or the nine percent of students who make up that well below uh, section, okay. <laughs> this will pull up all of the students within that range. <coughs> and then if we click down here on the seven or the 7% of students who scored did not meet on CMAS, it's not necessarily the same list of students. Um, so we wanted to clarify some misconceptions in the data by representing both. Okay. Let's go on ahead and click off of those. And one of the other neat features here is you can select any of these outside grade levels. Um, so let's dig in to um, our fifth grade outperformed. Oh, oops. Sorry, follow them. I was thinking I was going <laughs> to anticipate your. <clears throat> there we go. All right. So, this is another example of how we could clarify some misconceptions. You'll notice that our data changed. Even though these students outperformed that projection, it doesn't necessarily mean that there are high achievers. Okay. So, we still have students in the well below and below. Um, categories and then our students who um, were approaching or um, uh, did not meet here on CMAS. So that's another way that we, we've used both sets of data to clarify that. Let's see here. Um, so one of the reasons uh, why we decided to make this visualization is um, how it might endure over time. So as we're having conversations with our teachers around this data and information, map growth and CMAS are both standards-based assessments. So in theory, if our professional learning communities are standards-based, they're having conversations related to our Colorado academic standards, we're going to see our achievement gap narrow over time. So that's what we're hoping to see and that's why we have uh, multiple years of data represented um, as one of the filters. Anything else to add, Holly or team? All right, I'll hand it over to you. 
Oh, okay, we're ready. Okay, so I have this now in um, desktop, and this is the visualization, but um, I'm gonna demo building this from scratch for you guys. One of the things that I like to do, oh, you know what, let's, let's go back. I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Um, let me go back in and talk about some of the data, building the data sources. Um, we have our two different data sources, assessment data sources, which is the CMAS raw data and the map growth. Uh, assessment data. And so in order to come to re reproduce what um, Brian initially, I believe Brian was the one, right? Yeah. Um, um, created with the, the comparison was to find the fields that were, were going to allow me to do that programmatically. So in um, this inner join with the CMAS data source, we are looking at the result column from that and that, those values come in as um, number values from one to six, um, and they're correlated to the proficiency level as students, um, how they achieve on that, that assessment, with um, six being uh, the students who were not tested. And then we have to transform our uh, map growth data, but that comes in from these um, proficiency, the projected proficiency level two column, if you're familiar with your, your, your map growth data, um, they come in with the, the values of exceeds, met, partially met, did not meet. So we're making that, that transformation here to make those numeric values as well so that we can get to that comparison. Um, one of the things, the caveats I think we, we didn't talk about um, was these are the students who were assessed for winter uh, for map growth and then also assessed for CMAS. So they had to be assessed for both in order for this comparison to work. Um, so the, the students who did not take map growth, for example, during the winter, or maybe they weren't with us in our district during the winter, um, if, they didn't, if they were not assessed, they're not part of this comparison. And same then with CMAS, if they've opted out or their parents have opted them out, we're not using them in the comparison. The, <clears throat> this is the result of that um, join in the previous slide. And the two columns that we care about the most are the assessed CMAS proficiency, when they actually were assessed CMAS versus the projected CMAS proficiency from the map growth assessment. And just comparing those values as they align. Some of them are matching, some of them are outperforming, and some of them are underperforming. And so um, that's the one, one step of the transformation. Then we're just kind of bringing that in and making the, our, our, the field that we needed which is the um, projection outcome. That's a custom field that brought into SQL um, using the matched, outperformed, and underperformed categories. Okay, so it's just one little transformation before we bring it into the dashboard. So now we will go under the hood. <laughs> and uh, what I like to do is always start out with and create myself a filter template in my dashboards. Um, when I know I'm going to be making multiple sheets, it's just easier to make one that's kind of generic. I'm going to use all these all the time and just duplicate this sheet. So that's where I'm going to start and just duplicate. And then we're going to build it. So I have my notes in case I forget uh, an important piece. But the Sunburst is a category subcategory relationship. And so you just have to determine what you want your category to be and your subcategory to be. Um, and so in our case, the category is going to be our projection outcome. And I just have to find it. There we go. So I'm going to take projection outcome and slide that onto color. And this is just the order that I have done this. Um, you can probably find a YouTube video on, an, on a different method, which I watched a couple several times. Um, I'm, I'm putting that um, projection outcome on the color, um, I don't know what you call that, on just on the marks card. And then I'm gonna go ahead and change the, the type to pie so that it switches it to a pie chart. And I'm gonna make that bigger by going to entire view. And yeah, okay. And then I'm gonna choose to bring in our student number and drop that on the angle because we're looking for the percent of total for the students that fit into those categories. 
Um, so I dropped that on the, the pie chart angle and I'm right clicking on the student number to get this option to change the measure to use count distinct. And then I'm gonna go back and right click and choose a quick table calc of percent of total. And then one more time, I wish we didn't have to do this every time, but um, choose the cell, the breakdown by the cell. And then I'm gonna choose um, my labels. There we go, so we can see. You guys seeing that okay? Do you need me to make it bigger? Okay, all right. Um, so that's going to be my, uh, let's see, let's put projection. I'm gonna control click and put that on label. Okay, label as one, I wanted to do both of those. There we go. So I have my underperformed kind of describing what this, this pie chart means and the percentile or percentage. So now I'm gonna build the um, sunburst piece and that's just going up to the column shelf. I'm gonna right click to create a new calculation. We know there are more than one way to create a new calculation and I'm just gonna just use the sum function and zero. And then we're gonna control click and drag that over to make a copy of it so that we have two versions of this and I'm gonna make those, let's see, let's go to size, make those a little bigger again so that they're side by side but now there's the point where I have to decide okay which which side am I wanting to be the the, the colorful burst um, and I'm going to choose the left side so that um, this will be my grade levels my assessed grades so I'm going to choose that specific <clears throat> one that correlates to the first calculated field and then I'm going to bring in um, Assessed grade, and I'm going to put that on color instead. Oh, I've really messed it up now. <laughs> so let's take projection off. I might have to do this over, guys. I'm not following my my code. I'm going to have to go back. Let's do this over. <clears throat> I'm gonna do from the very beginning. I'm sorry. So projection outcome. Hi. And student number. This way this time. I haven't done that part yet. Okay. I'll just leave that there as it is for now. Calculation. Hopefully that gives some of you hope. <laughs> If you are new, that it's not always um, intuitive to remember everything you did to create this. Um, okay, so let's go back. All right, and now I will actually follow my my notes because I'm getting off track. Okay, so we're getting that assessed grade. Bringing that to color. I'm sorry, on the detail, that's what I missed, the step. Um, and then detail first because obviously it ha whatever happened just a minute ago um, happens. Um, and so if I can just then go on this little detail icon, then I can click color. And that's more what I'm expecting to see. And so it's now dividing each of those little pie segments into the assessed grade. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to take assessed, assessed grade and also throw that on. It's hard to do without a mouse. Sorry, guys. Trying to click. Okay. And then that also went percentile. So now I've got both my grade and my percentile of that specific grade in there. And if I didn't like the way this looked, I could 
just shift this up in the order uh, of my two text fields. It just depends on what you're looking for. Um, that's one option. And um, I'm just looking, it kind of makes sense for me to have these um, grade levels go from a lighter for a, or a smaller grade to a darker, as a lighter color from the, the higher grade to the darker color. So I'm leaving that, but you can alter that as well. Um, okay. So I'm going to set up the right hand side now. Let's see if I can do this one with that projection outcome label again as well as the total. Great. Okay, so this feels more like where we want it to be. And I can click on that label and bring it inside the, the pie chart now because it's going to get a little busy. On that outer ring. So I'm bringing that over. And then I'm going to change my size to my category, which is the projection outcome, to just make it a little smaller so that we do get that sunburst effect. All right, so um, I'm going to, I've, I've skipped a step on purpose so that when I go to dual axis, I can show you what happens. Um, we're seeing that the, the grays and the greens and the blues aren't really lining up with those inner pie charts. Do you see that? And the reason why is because we need, because we're using that percent of total, we really do need to make sure we're making our focus um, filter down to that one category that we were looking for. So we're looking for our most current and the specific category and the assessment name. And that's when we see the alignment. And so if you're starting to see your pie chart not align correctly, think about what are your filters? What have I set? What is my focus? Um, and and try to align your chart. So if I had started with my perfect filters, you, you probably wouldn't have seen that example. And I've come back to this uh, in preparation for this and discovered, oh my gosh, what's, why, what, what's wrong with my sunburst chart? I can figure, figure it out right away. So just a learning moment for me uh, that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, and, and if you find yourself having that issue, you know, you just come back and um, uncheck the, the dual axis and go back and double check your the rest of your chart or just bring it back into view. You can bring come in and out of the dual axis. Okay. So I'm going to skip over the tooltip pieces, but we would want to add a couple of more elements in here. We want to know not just our percent, but what is the total count of students that are making up that percent. And so I would add those to the tooltip. I would add, make sure that the underperformed is, well, that's in there. So that's great. Um, I would clean up the the value that's coming in here, that sum value, we don't need that. Um, those, those kinds of things that you just kind of, they're tedious and I'm not going to go over those just now. But I'm going to skip ahead to back to the dashboard and making sure um, we demo how the, if I can pin that, okay, how the action filters work. Because when we click on the inner pie, we know that we wanted to have specific um, data show up in, on the left side versus the outer pie slice. And those are two separate action filters. There we go. I'm just waiting for it to come back to. Okay. So from the dashboard menu, go to actions. And I have two of them. So one of them is named projection outcome. Let's open that to edit it. We are using the predict, prediction outcomes sheet on select, highlighting all the target sheets that we want it to be, and then showing all the values. But then this, this particular piece is what's important for that is to choose that selected field as a filter. So we have to choose our projection outcome field as well and choose that plus your data source and the target field as the projection outcome. And then make a very similar one it's almost exact uh, duplicate, only we're using assessed grade in, in the filter section so that the behavior happens the way we want it to in the dashboard. And so I think um, when I was looking for something that would make a great visualization, I really liked the Starburst pie chart. Um, but I am curious from the group if you've ever 
had an opportunity or, or if you had any other suggestions for if you, how you would do this differently if it wasn't a sunburst pie chart. So if you have any suggestions, love to hear them. Any questions for Stephanie or I then about the how, the why? I've I've never used the like that dual access functionality for this. I've always done it for like the donut chart. Oh. So I like the idea of combining it with that second measure because a lot of times I'll use it for like that donut chart where the in the inside is usually just like the Kind of the big angry number of whatever oh, I'm talking yeah. about. Okay. But I kind of like this because it it adds it just adds more information um, and it adds I don't know if everyone else has seen this but it almost adds like a 3D effect to it at least from my perspective uh, of just like the shadow at least on the green side but no, I like it I think it's cool. I know green's not easy for all folks to consume <laughs> as a color. Um, Blue and gray were kind of neutral palettes that we picked. Um, we could have picked probably something else too. So we're always trying to improve on our accessibility color mapping, but um, that is where it, it is as it states today. Um, so yeah, following up with, I love the sunburst chart. It's so cool. And I'm already like thinking, like, how can I try this out and use it? Um, but I am curious too, from a user perspective, how have your users reacted? And kind of, um, like, I assume they've needed a little bit of support just to get started and know, like, what is it telling me and how do I interact with it? Absolutely, Claire, great question. Um, so it has taken a lot of training. Um, this is the first visualization of its kind here in, in District 20. Um, and it is, again, comparing those two measures against one another. Um, so even though the linking study gives us those projections, what does it actually look like when we bring in that CMAS data side by side um, to, to show whether or not they're meeting that? So um, again, that's where we're, we're training our administrators, we're training our teachers when we have the opportunity to go out and do some of this work for them. Um, and I think what's exciting about this is there's a lot of potential here um, for different ways that they can, can take this data and run with it um, in the classroom. So, uh, you know, looking specifically at our underperformed students, it's not necessarily our low achievers. So, you know, what do we know about those students? Looking at that body of evidence piece, so it's not just these two measures, but having those conversations about what does this tell us about the student? outside of what we may already have um, other data and information. So yes, huge training component um, for teachers. And I think it just allowing them to dig into it a bit and play around and um, kind of digesting how it all comes together. Do you guys have a data warehouse that you pull data from? Are you working with flat files or? We do, we, we call it our data warehouse. <laughs> it may not be a traditional one, but we're bringing the flat file in from the assessment team when they're, when they're ready um, to grab that data when it's available. And then we're bringing it in um, and storing it there and then making our transformations in SQL. So um, our Tableau server then has the data connections. We bring in that data source, the SQL data source. Does that answer your question? We're happy to talk more after if you like have something that bubbles up um, after our presentation. One other quick question. Um, are you planning on growing this out to other assessments that you guys do? I don't know if you. Good question. I mean, there's an option. I think there's PSAT SAT data as far as the projection. What else? What's the other? Is there another? That's kind of the big one. Uh, when we look at map growth, they also have a SAT linking study. Uh, so we're currently uh, looking at that um, related to some of our strategic priorities and the goals as a district. Um, so we're definitely, this is kind of phase one, right? So we're, we're creating that buy-in among our staff and saying, 
look, map growth can be used as an indicator to predict how your students are going to perform on the state assessment. Um, one of the things that we have a lot of conversations about is the difference in rigor between these two assessments. Um, and so when we think about map growth versus CMAS or map growth versus SAT, map growth is a multiple choice um, assessment that's adaptive, whereas the state assessment has multiple components, they're asking students to um, explain their responses and getting into that deeper knowledge. Uh, same with SAT. So I think there is a lot of potential there. Um, right now we're just kind of building that foundation um, of, you know, like you can use this data. <laughs> and uh, so I think it's exciting, but also thinking about how we can build something similar to um, get us closer to our goals. Great question. So this gives them the correlation after both events have happened. Do you, are you finding that they're more interested in the first event now that they can see a correlation? Yeah, so uh, a lot of our conversations with teachers are around this specific document because this is what's driving this visualization. So if you look, um, specifically we were looking at math, so you'll look at the bottom chart here. Um, for fall, winter, and spring, it'll divide it up by grade level highlighted on the left. And then you can see what percentile students will need to score on map growth in order to, um, you know, what proficiency level they'll score on CMAS across the top. So you have the did not meet, partially met, approached, met, and exceeded. So we've highlighted met and exceeded and distributed this to administrators and teachers to say, like, where are your students at? How could you use this for goal setting purposes? Um, so they are getting more invested in that first event, that map growth assessment, because we're trying to, to emphasize that it, its purpose is for instructional changes. It pinpoints that student zone of proximal development. What are they ready to learn? And uh, so it's more, it allows us to be more proactive. Whereas CMAS, you know, this, this data is from last spring. Um, it's more of a reflective data set, right? So it's, it's how, how well did our practices work instructionally? What strategies were we using? Um, and even though they have a different group of kids every year, um, I think it's still an important part to consider in this whole body of evidence piece. Have you considered or are you considering um, adding demographics to those groups so that in Littleton Public Schools, we struggle to grow our students who begin the year below grade level. And so that would be looking at your top chart, right? Um, and so I'm curious about who's represented in the various groups and we're just coming off writing UIPs. So I'm thinking, oh, we would all set our goal to exceed the prediction and, um, my brain's going a million different places, but um, what are some what are some future considerations you have in mind to improve it? That's a great question. Uh, so here in District 20, we use uh, the data lab that houses all of our visualizations, and we actually have uh, that data separated from district, school, and teacher. So depending on the user and the um, level of access that they have to student data, they may only be able to access the district and school level. So we have um, a viz, this is the teacher level viz, but we also have a district and schools one that will show just the sunburst and it'll show reading and math side by side. So um, it's great for administrators to get that high level overview and then digging into the student details piece here. Another visualization that we have um, that's separate from this is our map growth teachers visualization that breaks it out by teacher and by student. Um, so that one would be really cool to share maybe at a future meeting um, so you can make those connections. So I think we separated them out because of the, the purpose, right? So this is um, looking at past data. So this is last year's data. And so if teachers wanted to look at this year's data, um, we wanted them to have that ability. So we did separate it out, but we do have another visualization that will show this same band for students in their class. And then it also breaks it down into the student details that has their achievement percentile, 
um, map growth puts out a what they call a RIT score, a Roush unit score um, for achievement, and then we also break down growth. So um, I think there's a lot of potential here, but I would love any ideas as to how um, we might incorporate some of that other data and information. We definitely have that demographic breakdown in some of those other visualizations. So um, I made a note because I was like, oh, I guess we could. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We could have added that. Yeah. Um, but I think the focus, again, was on the projection and those spe specific relationships, um, but regardless of demographics, groups, and, and if they're a SPED student or a 40504 student or ESL student. Um, so, but it's it's helpful to, if that's your lens, if you're a TAG teacher or if you're an ESL teacher and you're wanting to check this out, um, that would be helpful. So that's that's good feedback. Well, why don't we take a few minutes? We have our questions to ponder. Um, and so find an elbow partner next to you um, and pick one or two of these questions and let's just um, take maybe the next five minutes and discuss it. And we're here to help the next presenter set up if you would like some assistance.
<laughs> All right, I'm gonna pull everyone back together <laughs> before we um, head into our next presentation this morning. Just wanted to see um, anything that came up in your conversations that you wanted to share. Any questions or kudos for that great presentation that we just had? I do have a question around training. So for training administration and teachers, how, how did you do it? All right, so what did that look like? Yeah. Uh, so typically we will introduce either map growth or CMAS data, right? So we're grounding them in what it is that we're talking about. We'll bring in the linking study um, and talk through what that means. And then uh, we demo a lot. So we'll do um, a live demo of the visualization just like we did for, for each of you and walk through the components, give them time to process, ask questions. Then we allow them to go in and poke around and, and play around with it, um, start to digest the information. And then typically we provide them with like a data analysis protocol or even just some, some questions to get them thinking. Um, one of the pieces that we incorporated in the visualization was like that guiding question. I don't know if you all saw that above the sunburst, um, but that also helps as a guide as to like, what am I looking at here? Um, because it can be overwhelming, right? Uh, so we break it down into small chunks as we're presenting it, give them time to process and poke around give them that protocol. And then uh, we like to do it in a collaborative setting. So typically it's the, a similar group of administrators, either all at the middle school, at, you know, at the elementary school. Um, so then they're discussing what it is that they see might be a benefit, how they could use it, um, what information they might wanna take back to their teachers. Um, because District 20 is a site-based district. So that is an added layer. Um, of complexity, I would say. So a lot of our schools are at different levels as to how they're using the map growth data. Um, so it's really good for them to just have those conversations about how could you use this? Um, you know, what is this affirm for you or what questions do you have? What else would you all well, add? So we introduced it with middle school principals in the spring, right at the end of the school, right after school got out. And part of it was probably the time of year. And part of it was we didn't have the most recent CMAS results. But when we first shared it with them, it was kind of overwhelming and they didn't see a purpose so much in it. But it was in their head. And then right when we came back in early fall, we met with that same group of administrators and did the same protocol. They had heard it, seen it had a basic understanding of it, but now we had current data in there. And that second time around, then they were really eager to dig in and learn more. So it kind of took, I think, more than once to wrap their brains around what this could do for them and what it could look like, um, you know, in their building to improve instruction and how they can use that, so. The one other piece I would add is that um, our team, so I'm curriculum instruction and I have three teammates and two here and so forth is with the middle school principals. Um, we also, each one of us sat down with a principal team. And so we went through with their team. So we we're looking at their school specific data. So for example, one of our element middle schools, I'm sorry, like Eagle View, I sat with their principal and their admin team. And so then I had a screen and we went through their data together. They will ask very specific questions of me about their data so we could really individualize it. And so we did that two times in a row, spring and fall. And so I think that individualization where we kind of sat with team by team and not demoed it all and said, hey, go play with it. I think that was really helpful for our principals because then it also helped build those relationships. And then we could ask follow up questions. Well, have you thought about, you know, Steph brought up the rigor uh, and so forth. But I think that was helpful. And I think uh, what Michelle alluded to is we're finding timing is key uh, because administrators have a lot on their plate as do teachers. And so making sure that it's timely and relevant 
um, this visualization is very dependent on that CMAS data. And so getting it as soon as we can uh, in their hands um, and now that they have access to it and know how to use it, uh, that they can go in year after year once those CMAS results are loaded. Do you envision a uh, like a feedback process with that as they start to become more comfortable with it? Like, is there a, a yeah? Are you putting in place some sort of feedback as they look at it to be like, oh, I really wish X, Y, and Z was also in here? Or yeah. that's definitely our best hope. Uh, after we meet with our principal groups, we always put out a survey to say like what was helpful. What would you need more support with and things like that and just trying to constantly gather more information on what would be helpful to them but i think um, one of the things that we're working on here in district 20 is uh, getting teachers into these visualizations a bit more so we do a lot of work with administrators but we don't always see that trickle down um, and so we're hoping to um, work on that over the next several years and gather more feedback from teachers who should really be using this data, right? So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, great conversation. I think, you know, that really just shows like kind of the confluence of like great design of the data and the visualization, um, but also coming together with the people side of it and having to connect with your users and um, how much you can deepen the conversations when um, you do connect and look at their specific data side by side with them. So, um, all right, well, thank you so much to Holly and Stephanie. That was a great presentation. Thanks everyone for the conversation. Um, we're gonna move ahead to our next presentation of the morning. So um, we are joined by Dayang Zhou and Edwin Flores um, from Aurora Public Schools to talk about state reporting validation. Thank you. Uh, so I use my right? So, and uh, so today, um, Edwin and I will introduce uh, a practice. Actually, uh, we use in uh, we use in a rural public school to help really ease the burden of uh, reporting time uh, for the reporting staff because uh, before this uh, Pablo approach. Really, they have to. Uh, they had to really handle uh, thousands, thousands errors just during the reporting time. Not just uh, not uh, you know mention there's other reports too. October come is a very stress uh, stressful time for them. But uh, then since we have this one and uh, this process become like an ongoing kind of error uh, correction time that greatly reduce the stress and burden for the reporting staff and the school staff during the October count and during other reporting time too. So um, we're going to uh, show uh, our practice. And of course, uh, I know all other uh, districts have your own practice. Maybe we can just uh, see what we can learn from each other and then uh, probably um, you know, we go from there. <laughs> okay. Uh, so these are, these are some screenshots of the three dashboards we have. Uh, this is a one with the enrollment errors, uh, age on October first, and our state funding codes validation. And these are just screenshots. We'll go into the demo later. So this is this three uh, like a dashboard really is a major uh, you know parts we crack. Uh, arrows uh, in those three er uh, area. So uh, majority, uh, can you go back to the first one? Yeah, majority of uh, arrows um, would show up over here. And then uh, those blanks actually is not like a we leave it blank, but because all those errors are already clear to zero. And so at the beginning of this year, we saw like uh, over 900 errors, and, but getting closer to the reporting time. And then we down to, you see, one, five. So each of those uh, represent something, uh, you know, still have a question, not necessarily uh, real errors, maybe something they need to improve. 
firm. So uh, then that's uh, uh, you know uh, the approach uh, we use for this entire thing to crack everything, click everything, and then have a list over here. Uh, Adam already covered the sensitivity relation, so when she show, it will be okay. And the second would be the uh, funding, uh, would be age um, validation. So you see the blocks of age, so that um, really represent the age range just at uh, uh, October 1st. Uh, <clears throat> if the range is, uh, you know, is too far away, we know there's something wrong. We see some of like kindergartens have a 30 uh, year old or something, and apparently that's an arrow. So uh, this one show our visualization talk to me <laughs> is it right or wrong. And so uh, the third one is a uh, funding. So the funding one, uh, you see the red and the uh, green ones. Actually, it's not necessarily it's wrong, but it's something need to confirm whether it's a, uh, the right part is a kind of a need to recheck kind of a, a information. A green one of a, of course are definitely correct ones. So we, uh, I already talked about a little bit about the purpose, but um, so here's a, a summarize. What's the purpose of this dashboard can help us. And then uh, <clears throat> this dash dashboard really help our reporting um, data very accurate accuracy because this kind of process is a yearly ongoing. Whenever there are show errors and then they can just correct. And then, then uh, <coughs> so this, uh, um, Dashboard including uh, four parts like enrollment line arrows, age validation, state funding, uh, end of year clear up. And uh, so, the you want to talk second part reduce uh, CDE reporting errors and warnings. And so, uh, this mainly is uh, really help a lot. So with this dashboard, uh, we no longer we don't we no longer need each school to make uh, twenty different ad hoc reports for each error. Um, it's all in one visualization, and like the Ian was saying, this is an ongoing uh, monitoring and correction of data that goes on throughout the year, not something that we just rush on in October. Um, like she said earlier, uh, at the beginning of the year we had nine hundred errors, and now we only have like eighty five, um, and those will be fixed this month before we send out the report. And since we have less uh, errors now, uh, there's less communication, less going back and forth between our CD with CD and our school uh, reporting coordinators uh, with having to fix errors and having to fix things in their report. Okay. And then, then talking about the uh, you know reporting staff and the school staff burden during the reporting time is really uh, before uh, I got feedback from you know, the reporting staff, they said at very beginning, they saw like a 15,000 arrows during the reporting time. And then those uh, arrows must be uh, clear up, corrected within very short time, months, months, uh, two months. And the, between the central uh, reporting staff and then schools uh, reporting clerks. So though before with with this dashboard, really the communication is through ad hoc, and then uh, the reporting central reporting staff need to distribute those uh, ad hoc report to each of the school for their content only, then communicate with them what's the problem, how to correct them, and it's really uh, time consuming and uh, uh, a lot of a back and forth kind of uh, uh, conversation. Uh, really, is very add a lot of stress for both central staff and then also uh, for uh, school staff. Since we have this, uh, the communication part is really easy because for either central district staff or school staff, they can just uh, click the report and see the arrows. And the school staff only can see their own school. If they see any of the uh, arrows, for their school, they can just uh, hold, go ahead, uh, clear it up and correct it during the year. Don't have to wait and, um, to the October count or whatever end of year reporting. 
and for central staff, actually, when they notice something they need to communicate with school staff, they can just go ahead um, with the conversation ahead of time, and way ahead of time before the reporting time. So this uh, uh, really help a lot and make a easy to uh, ser serve as an easy tool for both uh, district and uh, schools. So uh, the impact of the, this da dashboard really uh, is uh, significantly reduce errors during the reporting time, of course. And so those are the examples um, I got from our reporting staff, like a uh, end status co uh, code 11. And, um, before this one is hard to notice because the one hard is uh, uh, if the student transfer from one school, and then supposedly uh, within the APS, supposedly the accepting school has an enrollment uh, lines for that school. But if they, uh, for that student, if they don't have it, that represents errors. But since there's no communication, nothing about this, those won't be found until the reporting time. But right now with this report, I mean, pretty soon once this, uh, you know, the uh, reporting generates something in consistency. One school already showed the transfer uh, end status 11. The other one doesn't have any enrollment line yet. That RL pump up right away. And then they can realize this is a problem and don't have to wait until reporting time to correct it. And so this typically, yeah, prior dashboard, this typically is uh, like a 200 to 300 arrows. Right now is a nearly, I mean, really manageable uh, size of the arrows. And then, um, so that's an example how many, uh, you know, arrows for each of type of uh, um, resident pupil attendance code reduced about uh, 500 arrows because of the approach. And the age validation report um, really is also uh, kind of a, uh, uh, official count date because of this report. I mean, they count this uh, age thing ahead of time so they can jump in and correct it right away. And so uh, this, uh, with this report actually for, it helps school staff to familiar what kind of uh, arrows it could be and uh, involved in all type of things instead of they have to you know, uh, rely on ad hoc report to tell them what's going on. So they can monitor their school data uh, yearly and with all the uh, this information uh, updated every day, actually. So, and the Edwin is going to do the Tableau demo for you and show um, the details. Um, so this is the Tableau dashboard we have. Um, it has a box for every different type of error that we have. Um, and then these blank spots, there is areas there, but uh, there's just not any, not any current areas. Um, and like she was saying, we can go over a few areas. Uh, for like a status of 11, the following line of enrollment should have a start status of 11. So there's ever a, a mismatch. Uh, it causes an error for a ninth grade some of our dropouts. Um, it's ninth graders who got enrolled during the summer, but before school even started, they dropped out. So the school didn't even see that student. And we, we don't want that affecting their graduation uh, rates. Um, and of course the dashboard is interactable. So you just want to isolate these two students, um, click on the error. And it shows us two students. Um, I don't think it let me. No, sorry, I don't think so. Um, we made a fixed browser size for the presentation so that we could cover student info and not have it being dynamic. So that's kind of why it's small. And then our actual Tableau server, it's a little bigger and the table, the student list is like a little yeah, wider. Actually, uh, Edwin right now is using desktop. If it is in the uh, 
Pavlov server that this uh, this place is not really wider than this one. And, um, this is our age validation uh, sheet. And like Dean was saying, uh, it's so this sheet's basically like a heat map, uh, just without the color coordinating of a heat map. Um, so it lets you see uh, if there's like a student that's like uh, kind of outside the age range. Like she was saying, sometimes we see like 20 year old and 19 year olds who are in kindergarten, which doesn't really make sense. But um, sometimes uh, there's you know typo typos when enrolling the students or. Uh, for some reason, somehow the parent's birthday gets put as a student's birthday. Um, so it just helps uh, highlight those students who might not be in the correct age range for that grade. Um, and all these dashboards have a school name filter, um, but they also all have real level security. So a, a state coordinating clerk at the school will only be able to see her own students. And then this is our state reporting validation uh, code funding dashboard. Uh, similar to the last one where it's kind of like a heat map of uh, all the different um, st uh, state funding codes. Um, 80s are uh, full-time funding codes, so that's where most students are. But we have like 85, which is our part-times. And um, like she was saying, uh, red doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. It just needs to be reviewed and confirmed that they have the proper funding code. Um, it's really it for the demo. Yeah. Some of the future improvements we want to do to the dashboard is uh, clean up the back end. Um, I'm like the third analyst that's worked on this dashboard, so it's just gotten pretty messy throughout the years of iterations and updating it. Um, and then we also want to add student schedules and required hours uh, just for funding, just to make sure they are in the proper, um, have the proper funding code. Um, and also the total credits and many of options for graduates. And going back to the funding, adding the bell schedule calculations, um, making sure that schools have the proper amount of uh, contact hours with students. And also have a concurrent enrollment offsite program, a student program dashboard. Um, do you guys have any questions? Um, you, I'm assuming, but maybe I'm incorrect. Um, it sounds like you have um, site-based enrollment, and then 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 data comes to the central office, perhaps versus a central registration model at the main district, and then and schools aren't really involved in the enrollment of students. Is that accurate? No, outside student is really. Uh, you know, the student, like uh, we call it APS, they take some classes from um, other offsite um, programs, but those are, they still, we still report them in, uh, in Phoenix campus, but they represent something, you know, uh, not really taking classes from their home school, but they take classes from offsite uh, program. And the, those registration, uh, actually, we call secondary uh, kind of a service, and then uh, versus you know the school from uh, the the student from home uh, school called primary service, but especially high school student. Some uh, there's there's some student particularly. I mean they mainly take outside uh, program courses. And so that's why we set up separately. And then, then like a CE student too, we, um, APS have a, a kind of a close partner with uh, CCA, uh, or, uh, Community College Aurora, and the Pekin Tech uh, College. So a lot of students uh, from uh, APS High school student, they take a uh, class from those sites, and then you know they register through still APS, but their class site is uh, either um, from offsite um, programs like a Pekin and the C uh, CEs and uh, CE and Aurora uh, CCAs, those CE 
courses or Pekin's CPE courses. So uh, I don't know whether you know I explained clearly or not. Well, that also is interesting. Um, <laughs> I think if like, for example, if I'm a new family, if I moved into the Aurora School District um, boundary, where do what do I start at the main district office to yes. enroll my students or it's yes. not school at the school? Yeah, at the school. Okay. They are our student registered. They all they uh, even if they they are in the offsite program, but they do have a home school. For example, sure. they are gateway a high school students, but taking classes. Uh, so everyone else. comes into the main district, registers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then they're assigned their school. Right. Okay. Just exactly. double. Just wanted to clarify your process then for right um, and October count. Well, only for like first time students. Um, mm -hmm. If you're a new family coming to APS, you go register your student at the central admissions office, and they'll give you like a, they'll assign you to your like first school, and then um, from then uh, you kind of go. You have sometimes depending on the boundaries, you have options. Um, and that would be with the school staff at Prince Charles. Um, but also all the school clerks uh, handle all like the end statuses. So if a student can from their school to another, uh, they take care of that. Or if like a student is not like if they have a student who uh, hasn't attended school in like uh, mm -hmm. one, two weeks, uh, it's themselves that look into it and see if maybe they transferred, maybe they dropped out or whatever the case may be. It's the school staff that does that. Okay. Yeah, use use the microphone, though, Lisa. We're we're recording, so we're having to use our microphones to capture the sounds. I just want to make sure that I have it clear. So initially, the enrollment is created by central registry, and then, but all of the end dates and transfers are done by the school registrar. Correct? Yeah. Okay. And uh, they process their own drops and their own transfers? Yes, yeah. at the school. Okay. And if it's like a, like a in-district transfer, it, it's two different schools handling. So it, it's the initial school that does the end status and, the, and ends their enrollment. And then it's a new school that takes in the new enrollment and makes a new start status. So like, Going back to that same area where it's a, a in district transfer, um, the two schools have to communicate with each other and say like, "Hey, uh, this is a transfer student. Make sure that uh, his start status is 11." Um, and that's a common, that's a very common area that we have. And it's yeah. up to them to communicate with each other. The reason is that I mean, with that helps is uh, you know the the student from one school said, oh, I'm going to transfer to another school. And then this original school may code, uh, put the code 11. But if the student never show up in the new school, I mean, the original school, they won't know. And they still put a code as a 11 as a transfer. But then the new school, I mean, maybe the student change mind, move out of a district or even drop out. If we don't have this report, we don't have any communication. And so that's why this really helps, uh, you know, the coordinate two schools easily. And if they say there's a 11, uh, 11 end code, uh, exit code over there, and but new school, um, there's no enrollment line. So that means the student didn't go to the new school and then they need to go back to change their code to something else. So what about choice? Do you guys have that at, is it run by your central office or is it run by the schools? So this, we, I mean, for us, I mean, we are the district, mm -hmm. district accountability and research office. And uh, um, our office is responsible for rep do the state reporting. So it's just the reporting. That yeah, just about. reporting. Okay. We don't do the data entry registration or anything, but we are providing kind of a monitor for the data part, assist the school, um, correct their data. So it seems like you, if you go back to the first interactive screen, that you've anticipated the most popular errors that occur. 
and you've seen a benefit to addressing those errors along the way and not yes. only addressing them at crunch time right. and that you've made this more systematic. Right. Um, so I'm curious if you've thought about the application of this to SBD. Yes, that's why I need to uh, communicate with Actually, all those arrows and it's really our uh, district reporting staff recommend us. Really, she said, oh, we need to monitor that because she is the one to run the uh, CDE's ad hoc report. She knows what caused those arrows. Then she gave us a kind of a request, said, okay, I want this one. So at the beginning, this uh, uh, state reporting validation. We don't have that many, many types. So it's ongoing. It's ongoing. Yes, both sides. If she noticed anything new, she she feel like a, uh, worth to put into this dashboard and we will too. So that one uh, really, uh, I think I remember um, the newer one is a resident, resident county code before we didn't have it and then we add it later, and there's a, uh, let me see, there's a kind of a nice, great summer um, enrollment, something like that, but it's already cleared, it's not going to show up. All those ongoing things is all um, because our reporting staff noticed something worth to uh, really put on. If it is like a one or two individual kind of error, it's not worth it, but if it occurred, hundreds or, you know, 50 even that was to put it over here. So that's how we generate type of arrows over here. For your district, you may have a different uh, type of arrows. I mean, really you want to put, put on the dashboard. Dashboard has also uh, like helped the school's uh, reporting clerks uh, from like they get familiar with their errors. When our state reporting coordinator first started it with the district, uh, there was like 15,000 errors across the school, uh, across the district. And now that like, you know, the clerks know what the errors there are and then know how to handle it themselves. Every year we see less and less errors. And this, this year there was only like 900 at the beginning of the year. So it's helped every year. Yeah. That reduce a uh, lot. Is there really uh burden reduce a lot of stress during the um, October count and other reporting times. Are you guys connecting directly to your student information system? There's an intermediate pro process to pull. So uh, our so our data from the campus gets pulled like at 9 p.m. into the uh, SQL data uh, to our SQL server and then um, Tableau pulls it from our SQL server uh, at midnight or in the early morning. So it's uh, uh, really we uh, our system like a data warehouse refresh every night. So uh, during the daytime, any corrections will be refreshed and um, get to into the update for next morning. So it's a in sequence, the SQL um, server data warehouse need to refresh data and then it Tableau. So pick up from uh, data warehouse. So next morning, and we'll have a uh, new data uh, to show what uh, new changes for this. So they give another um, kind of a timely um, see whether my correction valid and the still uh, the error is still there or not, and uh, whether there's uh, anything new uh, or not. So it it can keep monitoring. So do the schools have their own dashboard to look at? No, or this is a, a published in our Tableau server. So if they are Tableau server user, they just log in to take a look at this um, report by themselves. We don't need to uh, give them new report every morning. So, so they have, just do right. it. Mm -hmm. So we have real level security. Uh, so even though I'm able to see, oh, this isn't dashboard, but if I clicked on this, I would be able to see all schools. Uh, our, a staff member at Range View High School will only be able to see Range View High School's students um, and not any other schools. Any other questions? Do you have 
um, standards around how often they're expected to go in and review and alleviate or address any errors? That one I didn't ask my <laughs> coworker. I mean, from district office. I bet getting closer to the reporting time. Maybe those corrections, I mean, timely corrections, maybe, you know, is mandatory, but I don't know how frequently, but if they want to do it, I mean, correction is any time year round. It's not like a concentrate to the um, reporting time. But of course, I'm pretty sure, um, you know, uh, my office, you know, reporting staff would enforce some kind of rule during the reporting time, you must correct it by what date. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, kind of related um, or building on that last question too is I wonder if um, have you explored using like data driven alerts or subscriptions or anything like that to kind of push um, the dashboards out to users at certain times that they should be looking at it? Uh, so far, I don't think we uh, adopt that methodology yet. And uh, if it is really necessary, especially for this report, I think it worth it. And with the, you know, um, we must know the connection, uh, who is in charge of this kind of uh, um, action. So maybe uh, we can talk about when, I, when we go back to office, we can talk about whether we can build kind of a, a subscription distribution kind of calendar for those uh, uh, school level dis um, reporting clerks. That's a good suggestion, thank you. Um, thank you both for that presentation. Uh, let's take just like three-ish minutes and we'll just do that uh, kind of pairing up uh, to think through a couple of these questions uh, as we kind of get set up for the next session and then I'm going to take a break after that so you all can get water, go to the restroom, things like that. Cool. Thank you.
All right. Um, before we take a little bit of a break, just because I have to go to the restroom, but um, does anybody have any thoughts, questions, or uh, things that came up as you were discussing the October count use case uh, that came up for you or your district? I really appreciate the use of data to help people have better practices. Like, oh, because I see what kinds of errors there are, I can be more conscientious about um, inputting information more clearly and preventing errors. And so I, I heard that theme in both things, just being more conscientious because I have access to data. I think um, for us, we were thinking about what ways we might utilize something similar. And so in talking with Holly um, and working in the assessment department, we work a lot with SVD and cleaning up the data from that side. And so um, we're a four person team for the entire district of 26,000 students and 40 plus schools. So that can be quite a burden um, so we have a lot of systems in place to try to be proactive about that. But um, in talking with Holly, we were thinking about, you know, what, what could this look like for, for those purposes from the assessment department and even, you know, the secretary who does a lot of the cleaning up of that at the, the final kind of phases of that process. So thank you. Well, Lisa is our head of central registry that came to watch your demo. And it sounds like uh, she'd want to do something similar, probably look a lot different, but it was good to see what you guys are doing so she could have an idea of what's possible. Yes. So it sounds like they're slicing and dicing the data in a very programmatic way in Excel, all of them manually. So I think this would be a good replacement for that task. We do, we do. We have, I think, a similar setup to you guys where we pull a, a copy, essentially, of IC from uh, production into our data warehouse. Same thing like us. It does, that make it easier. Yeah. Yep. I think it's very similar. Mm -hmm. We don't pull a full copy just because the database has gotten so big. We moved to IC hosted last summer. I'm not sure if you guys are in a similar setup. Are you guys on prem? So you, you said you moved to IC, uh, kind of a storage for your yeah. data? Yeah, yeah. our current setup is we have IC hosted in the cloud. We used to have it on-prem, and so it was no problem getting data back and forth in a SQL server. Uh -huh. But now, because it's in the cloud and our database is fairly big, it can be kind of a slow um, nightly job to transfer right. that down to us. So we have, we, a, yeah. we have the same problem actually so uh, really probably that's our uh well the solution for our problem too the data is too big mm -hmm. it'd be great to have it all real time but not necessarily always feasible great thank you thanks thanks everybody um i also kind of saw that theme of empowering uh, empowering the people that are probably closest to the problem. Um, and I really like that idea of the, uh, we call it the art of the possible. And so things, meetings like this where we get to, you know, maybe I'm not going to use that exact same use case or it's going to, you know, it's going to look different. But there's so, so many times that I don't know what I don't know. And so when I see someone else do it, it's like, oh. And then my mind can kind of start to make these connections. Uh, to my specific situation, uh, and so I can start to kind of piece some of those things together. So thank you all for being willing to do that. Uh, let's take like a two-minute break, and then Claire, I'll have you set your just demo or use case up. Okay. Uh, any questions, comments? Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it.
Okay, um, we'll go ahead and keep moving along with our agenda. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of a Tableau learning session. Um, so in a moment, Ryan will um, do a wonderful Tableau tutorial <laughs> for you. He, we can learn so much from him um, about dynamic zone visibility. But as we were planning and talking about this, I was thinking, oh, I had just um, put some of this into practice. So I thought I could share my use case um, of how I've done this with CMAS data. Um, and also, I just wanted to add, this came out from um, after I attended this last year's Tableau conference. Um, I went to a session about dynamic zone visibility, and I was so inspired. I saw an example there, and I thought, we could do this with CMAS data. So um, I came back, and I kind of worked, worked this out um, to release along with our CMAS data release this fall. So um, the concept here. The way I'm using dynamic zone visibility is to add kind of an extra layer of interaction to this chart. So um, what we see here at the top, oops, let's see if I can zoom in there. Um, we've got just like a pretty basic chart of um, average CMAS scale scores. My favorite bar chart, I use them all the time. Um, so starting with something really familiar for our users. So what we've got going on here, um, we you know, have labeled the year of data that we're looking at. Um, like I said, average scale scores, and it's broken out by uh, test grid level and content area. Um, I've labeled the bars with the um, scale score value and the number of students. Um, and where that becomes important is because as I designed this, I was thinking about, I want our users to go a little bit deeper into this summary data and actually start to see who those students are. Um, so here you can see we're looking at just kind of a slice of middle school students. I'm going to drill down into seventh grade. Um, so the dynamic zone visibility use case here comes out when you click onto one of these bars. Um, and at that point, what happens is a box and whisker chart shows up at the bottom with um, a data point representing each student who is making up that total um, in the top bar. Um, so for a user at a school, they're going to see their own students. They can um, hover over the tooltip and they get to see actually like who is this student. I've obscured it here, but they can actually see who that individual student is. And just a note within that tooltip using the Viz and Tooltips feature, I've also put a little like cheat sheet about how to interpret a box and whisker <laughs> because I know that's not super intuitive or even something that most users might have interacted with before. Um, so that's the functionality of how I, I set that up. But I think what's been really useful here, so again, kind of, you know, this is where I'm starting to layer on and like build multiple different techniques to like make this as usable as possible. Um, the real like next conversation I want people to get to is thinking about differences between groups and what those different distributions of our groups of students look like. So right now I'm looking at, again, this is just all of those seventh grade students, but I have added this um, parameter control here where I can disaggregate that data. And so for example, if I disaggregate by ethnicity, um, we can start to see um, some of the issues that we were very much focused on in Boulder Valley about um, disproportionality between our groups and seeing achievement gaps um, within our student data. So again, this is, you know, a pattern that we talk about a lot in terms of average differences between groups. But what I think I've been able to add using dynamic zone visibility here is to really help our educators drill down and see who those individuals are and see that it's not just an average number, but actually what's the distribution of um, all of the students that make up that average and start to explore who they are in a given school. Um, all right, so I think that was it for my use case, just showing one thing that's possible um, with this technique. So with that, I will hand it over to Ryan to get a little tutorial.
All right. I feel that can be tricky. Uh, give me one second. All right, there it is. Um, I'm gonna sit down because I want to use my mouse. Because I'm gonna be using containers. Um, and containers are a pain uh, when you have to use your little mouse pad, so. Uh, and Holly, I'm impressed that you started from scratch. I'm gonna do this like a cooking show where I have the different stages of it already built so that I don't have to start from scratch. So when you did that earlier, I was like, oh, behind. OK, um, so I'm just going to show kind of the mechanics behind dynamic zone visibility. Um, I've just borrowed a couple um, kind of like high level uh, key performance indicators from like two different education dashboards that we've built. So we have some at risk data that we're looking at. And then we have attendance rate summaries. Um, and so what I want to show with this is we all probably create these different dashboards that have different audiences. Well, we probably create different dashboards that have similar audiences, but they probably want to be viewing them more or less uh, around the same time, but they don't want to see them together, right? So when I'm looking at my at-risk students, um, you know, I might be diving into that a little bit, but then it's like, okay, so I've identified a couple of my at-risk students Maybe I want to then switch over and say, okay, so let's look at some of their attendance uh, records, and I want to see, you know, what's going on there, and then that could then lead us into grades, transcripts, things like that. So the approach I'm going to do with this is that instead of creating different dashboards and kind of using some of the kind of like page navigation, we're going to use dynamic zone visibility, so I can give my end user the chance to say. With this dashboard right here, what do you want to see? Do you want to see the at-risk part of this dashboard, or do you want to see the attendance part? So that's what we're going to do. So the first thing you have to do to create kind of the dynamic zone visibility is create uh, your parameter for it. And so for this one, I'm just going to call this uh, at-risk or attendance question mark. Um, I'm a big fan of doing uh, list values as integers instead of strings because I don't like typing things. And so on the back end, Tablet's just noticing that this is a one. That way I don't have to always type at risk. I can always just type a one or a two. In this case, will be our attendance. All right, so once you have that parameter, the next thing you have to do is we're going to, for as many options as you have, we want to have, um, I, at least in my experience with it, we have to have that many kind of uh, true false calculations. Um, so there's kind of like two prongs to this. Tableau needs to have a, a parameter, and then it has to have a true false calculation for it to reference. So we're going to create those two calculations. And I'm just going to call this first one at risk showing. And all I'm going to say for this one is that my at risk or attendance equals one. I'm going to click OK. And then let's duplicate that one. And then this one we will say attendance showing. And then for attendance, we just want that to equal two. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, all right. So I'm going to go and click OK. So I have my two different calculations and I have my parameter. Um, at this point, I really actually don't need anything else to do on my actual worksheets. Everything else is going to happen now inside of the dashboard. So I'm going to go back to this dashboard. And has anyone here done the like traditional sheet swapping kind of 
back in the day. Okay, so some of us have. Um, one thing that I really like about dynamic zone visibility is that it can be applied to containers instead of just to worksheets. So with that sheet swapping, you would put a filter on a worksheet that was that true or false. And depending on if it was true or false, that visualization would just filter itself out. Uh, but you had to apply it to the worksheet. With dynamic zone visibility, I can now apply it to specific areas of my work of my dashboard, and so I can apply it to multiple sheets, filters, uh, really any sort of object that I want. So to help us with that, I'm going to put all of my at-risk information. We're going to put all of that into one container, and then I'm going to put all of my attendance rate summary information into another container. Uh, so bear with me as we do that, because if you've ever worked with containers, you know that it can be kind of the wild west out here. All right, so I'm going to bring out my vertical container. So here is my vertical container. So I'm going to kind of just work through the process of getting everything up here into that. Um, one thing I like to do as I'm working on containers is I will kind of just arbitrarily make my dashboard size a little bit bigger, give me some space to work with. And then I also always, I shouldn't say always, most of the time, I bring out a blank object into that container just so that I have something to kind of butt up against. Um, too many times I've run into not being able to do that. Okay, so now let's work on getting kind of these. So these three are already in their own container. Um, if you click on a visualization and then you double click on the suitcase handles, that's what I call those, that'll select the next object up. And so you can keep doing that and that'll keep kind of moving you up in that hierarchy of objects. Once I've gotten kind of the next level that I want, I'm going to drag this one down in here into that vertical container. You can see Tableau is now butting it up against that blank object. If I want to confirm that it's in there, I just double click it again, and now I see that it is in fact in my vertical container. That went smoother than I was expecting. All right, so now I'm just going to bring in some of my lines here. I think I have too many of those, but we'll find out. Select all those. I want my at risk to be in here. You know what I think happened? But this is going to be a challenge. Ready for this one? We have to get all of these in between those two gray lines. So, how do I want to do that? Um, we're going to bring. Above that, uh, yeah, that's going to do it. And then, there it is. Okay. All right, so at this point, I have my blank, or I have everything I want in there. So I can actually just get rid of that blank. Um, and then I'm just going to do some resizing up here. That does not need to be 900 pixels or 250, apparently. Okay, so we're just going to play with that. All right, so everything for at risk is in its own container. And now I'm just gonna actually repeat the same thing for my attendance summary. It might actually already be in its own, but just for the sake of the demo, I'm gonna get it into its own container as well. Let's just make sure, perfect. Okay, so now it is in that container. All right, so everything is containerized. Um, so now we get to actually do the magic. So what I'm gonna do is let's go ahead and first, uh, I recently discovered the show hide cards button. I don't know if any of you have seen this. It's always been there, so it's not new. Uh, I've never clicked it until one day I did. And this is like a quick way where you can show your parameters, filters, like it has all the things. Um, I never knew that. So I'm going to just go ahead and show my at risk or attendance parameter. Um, one thing I don't I don't always do this for like my uh, like production level ready dashboards, but one thing I like to do, kind of as I'm playing around with things, is I'm going to make this a floating object. 
And then what I do is I'm going to position it just off my screen so that it doesn't take up any of like my development space, uh, but I can still access it and I can still play with it. You have to type in that 1001. If you try to drag it off the screen, Tableau thinks you're getting rid of it. So you have to type that in. All right, so now I have that. So what I'm going to do is let's go ahead and select my at-risk container. And I kind of keep selecting all my different uh, suitcase handles until I get that container that houses everything for at-risk. So once you have that, you're going to be here in your layout pane. And you're going to come here where you see this control visibility using value. So we're going to check that button. And what we're going to do is we're going to click that none. And then I'm going to click this at-risk showing. Once we click at risk showing, nothing happened because remember over here, my at risk or attendance is set to at risk. So if you think back to that calculation we made, we said if that parameter equals one, that was it. So that's returning true. So Tableau is saying like, cool, that's true. So nothing's happening. So now let's do the same thing down here for our attendance summary. So I've selected that whole container going to click this control visibility using value and then for this one I want to use the attendance showing so now when I click attendance showing that one disappears so now I can give my end user this parameter so if they want to see the at risk they have that at risk performance indicators that they're looking at if they want to see attendance my attendance ones are going to show up beneath it and one thing you have to play with here is the sizing of things uh, I think I just have a blank between them. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to get rid of that. And let's see if that does it. Oh, it does. So now I can toggle between kind of my performance indicators that I'm looking at. And I don't have to navigate or go anywhere else. I'm going to let Tableau put all of it onto one dashboard for me. I'm going to pause there. Questions? Comments about that. I have a question. Yeah. About um, the the title of like when we used to have to do different containers for the titles to also be dynamic. Um, are you going to speak to that? Or, um, or is there? So you, we want the title to update with what they've picked. Yeah. Um, I wasn't going to talk to that, but we can. Okay, not to put you on the spot. No, that's all right. Um, so there's a couple ways we could do it. Because we're hiding the actual container itself, I could just not have a title for my dashboard, and I could put the individual titles that I want into each one of those containers. So as they show at risk, um, it shows that. Another thing we could try is because it is a parameter, I'm going to double click on my title up here, go to go to insert. And then let's insert this parameters at risk or attendance. And so what this will do is this will embed the value that they chose. And this will embed the show as, not the back end. So it won't say like one or two. It'll show what the end user sees. So now we see that this is our attendance example dashboard. And then if they do at risk, we see that this is now our at risk dashboard. So it was kind of a, it's up to you. Um, I also hated that about um, the sheet swapping is you could never do it with titles. And so I always had to like duplicate basically every sheet that was hiding so that I could get that stupid title to show up. I don't know about you all, but I feel like I spend so much time on labels and titles and it's so annoying because you're like, this is such a, such a small thing in the grand scheme of this dashboard that is taking it too much time. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I would do either one of those. Other questions? For it to be out here. Yes, so the question was, does the container have to be floating? And are you talking about for the visibility? I don't think so. Um, what makes it a little bit more, um, I guess, challenging is having to deal with 
the other aspects of the dashboard that aren't dynamically showing or hiding and working on that spacing. So I kind of like yours and we can kind of see how it's showing up on mine now too, where the bottom part of this will just have some of that kind of blank white space. Um, I would fill this up with like, you know, student roster, um, some sort of trend line, something like that. But you have to, like you have to be able to create kind of that space for it to, to pop up somewhere. Um, but you could do it as um, floating also. And then kind of uh, if you've ever done like an instructions overlay where you have this dashboard and so you have kind of like that info button up top, I imagine you could do something like that too, where when they click that, then you use that dynamic zone visibility to have that show and it would just over, it would sit on top of everything. I haven't thought about that. Okay. We have a little bit more time. So if you're all down to go crazy, I'm going to show you another one, but this one I want you to, to follow with me. So I can't take credit for this one. I wish I could because it is slick, um, but it's not mine. But I think it's a fun one to show. So if you'll go uh, to this URL, this uh, is not spam. Uh, this will take you to Tableau Public. <laughs> and so there is a, a dashboard on Tableau Public that um, Stephanie, who also co-leads this with Claire and I, uh, she sent this to me about a week or two ago. And it's just, it's really, I like it a lot. So I want you all to see it. Um, and then I'm going to open up the hood on it a little bit so you can see kind of what, uh, I believe it's a she, what she's doing with this dashboard and how she did it. Um, it's just using super store data. Um, and then let me know if you're having uh, trouble finding it. You will know you're in the right spot if it looks like this. Uh, I can show. Uh, that's good. I'm glad. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Takes you to like Total Wine's website or something. Sip, literally sip whiskey. <laughs> 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 Ooh. Okay, um, and then this dashboard specifically on Tableau Public, you can download it, so that's what I did. I just downloaded it, opened it up in desktop. So if you would like to do that, um, feel free to do that, and then you can kind of follow along with me. Um, if you don't want to do that, you can just look at it online and then follow uh, with what I'm doing. I'm not going to be recreating any of the things that she did, um, but I do want to just highlight uh, some of the differences that she used and then also like where the dynamic zone visibility parts that we talked about today come into play. As we're all getting that pulled up, one thing that I really like about uh, the dynamic zone visibility more so than the sheet swapping um, is because I can apply it to objects on my dashboard, I haven't actually done this yet, so I think it would work. Um, but you should be able to create almost like a template where I have my template dashboard, kind of like we saw with Holly earlier where she has her filters, kind of template sheet that she just duplicates and uses. We would do that with our dashboard. And so on this dashboard, I would already have just some generic like option one, option two, option three parameters with the dynamic zone visibility already in it. And then I would just apply that dynamic zone visibility to the individual containers. And then as I build my dashboard, I would put in the corresponding pieces into the dashboard object or container that I want to use. So instead of having to recreate this kind of functionality every time, I have kind of that built out swapping uh, feature. Like it's already working and all I have to do is fill the container. Like I said, I haven't actually done that, so if you do it, let me know. Okay, so here we are on our Create Parameter-Driven Tabs in Tableau. So this is using dynamic zone visibility. 
in a unique way. So what she has us here is that if I wanna see my metrics A set, we click that. If you wanna see the metrics B set, you click on that and you get an entirely different set of metrics uh, for this specific dashboard. And then if you click on C, uh, we just have some kind of placeholders here. What I like about this dashboard, I'm gonna go to presentation mode because it's a little bit cleaner. Uh, she even has the little underline that's showing up, which is just beautiful. I would have never done that, but it just, it looks so nice. So we're gonna talk about how did she actually do this. So this metrics A set, B set, C set, these are, this is actually just a worksheet. So let's go look at that worksheet real quick. She has three different calculations up on the top called metrics A set, metrics B set, and metric C set. And so those are really just calculated fields over here in our data, our data pane. So if you right click on one of those and click edit, all those are, and all three of them are the exact same, is it's just 0, 0.0. So kind of like we saw Holly earlier when we went to create the uh, dual axis for our pie chart, how we like could type up in the rows or column shelf and just type like sum of one. That's essentially what's happening here is we're just doing this 0, 0.0, but we're creating it as a calculated field. So then, um, I kind of like the idea of building it out. Maybe I don't. I'm just trying to decide where I want to go with this. Um, I think we're okay. So then, because I have my three different pills up there, we have four different marks cards. So I have a different marks card for each one of those pills, and then we have the all marks card. And then this is the sneaky part. So on each one of these uh, metrics A set, she has this ag min one. But then if you go to the metrics B set, it's ag min two. And then what do you think C is? Ag min three. So that's where I'm getting my one, two, and my three. So now, if we go look at our metric set selection parameter, so we talked about that idea. To do dynamic zone visibility, I have to have a parameter. Well, you'll notice in my dynamic or my metric set selection parameter, we have three options, one, two, and three. So this is how she's gonna tie those calculations to the parameter. So one of them is one, one is two, and then one is three. Questions about that? That one took me like a second when I first found it, where I was like, how is she doing this? So we then have metric A selected. So let's go ahead and look at that one. Just right click edit. And again, we see this same uh, calculation that we had. We just have the metric set selection, does it equal one? Remember this will just return true or false. Uh, if you click on the metric B selected or C, uh, they will say the same thing with their corresponding numbers. So now if we go back to our dashboard, we're gonna do is we're gonna come up here to dashboard actions and we're gonna click on this metric set A. I'm just gonna click edit. So this is an edit parameter action. It's applied to just the tab labels. So those were the three labels that we saw going across. It's targeting that metric set selection and then the source field is that agmin one that was on the marks card. And we're just saying to do the sum of it. So what is the sum of the number one? And it's just one, she's brilliant. So then if we go look at metric set B, she again is just saying that it's happening on those labels. The metric set selection is the parameter that it's targeting. And then this one is the agmin two. And again, she's just setting it to a sum. So the sum of the number two is two. So this is how she's getting to set that parameter as a one, two, or a three. So then when I'm here on my dashboard, when I click metric set A, I'm assigning one to that parameter, which then kicks off the true for that container. And then if you're doubting me, if you select this container, go to layout, here we see this control visibility using, and we see this metric A set selected. And then I was also really curious, it's like, how did she do that underline? Well, the underline is its own individual sheet. 
uh, and she essentially repeats the same kind of process here, but instead of um, using text to create the labels, she changes it to a Gantt bar and then uses this uh, size. We have this size field over here, uh, which is just the number one. So all it's doing is it's assigning whichever one that has been selected a Gantt bar size of one, and then everything else is set to zero. And then we have our color legends over here. You can see that every time it's false, she just colors it white. And then every time it's true, she colors it blue. So that then if they change, whichever one's true then becomes the blue one and the other two are just the white kind of lines. And then to hide this from us, she has a blank container that sits right over that worksheet so that I can't click anything. So me as the end user just, oops, sorry. Me as the end user just thinks it's magic because she's hiding the actual worksheet that's doing it behind that blank container. It's just brilliant. Um, so cool. Questions about that? I know that's a lot to digest. Um, that's kind of why I wanted you all to have the, the, the workbook itself so that you could click around and play with it uh, later when you probably have a little bit more time to like actually sit and digest what's happening. Um, but I thought it was just a really, really slick way of doing the dynamic zone visibility. Questions about this one or just the process in general? I have a question. Sometimes I have started to do the dynamic zones on my dashboard and then something happens or I need to change my design in the dashboard. Yep. And then I feel like I can't get back to where I was with like something gets messed up and I feel like I have to start over. Do you have any suggestions for managing? Um, and I'm trying to think of the example, but yeah. it, it feels like I've gotten away from either the container that held the object yeah. or or something has happened and then I can't go back or if, if I've added too many objects into the one container and then I change my mind and I, you know I'm not exactly sure have you ever experienced some just frustration with your dynamic zone visibility building um, how you manage that I haven't but I have experienced it around like containers <laughs> Um, and I, I feel like part of that dynamic zone visibility frustration probably, I'm sure some of it stems from like the container part. Um, my kind of suggestion with that I guess here's how I would probably do it. So if something was hiding or not hiding that I feel like should or shouldn't be and it's doing the opposite of what I think um, probably what I would do is make sure I'm on this layout pane container uh, this pane and then as I'm clicking through my different I would just keep clicking on the the container handles so that as it's moving up in that hierarchy I can see over here like at what level in that item hierarchy is the visibility applied to and then from there I can start to maybe piece together that's like oh okay the reason this title's not hiding is because it's it's sitting in the container that's actually one up from where the visibility is applied um i also as i'm building it just and i kind of tried to demo that a little bit as i build my containers out i'm constantly checking to make sure that whatever i just put into the container actually got put in there because that's happened to me so many times where i think it's in there and Tableau really just moved it on top of the container, but it looks like it was in there. And so, kind of like, well, I'll see if I can show you an example. Uh, so like this dashboard, where it's like, I think it, I put it here, and I, you know, it's like, I swear I saw that dark rectangle, but then when I drop it, Tableau puts it there. So it looks like it's in the container, but then if I dig a little bit deeper, I realize that it's, oh, it's still actually in my entire tiled container. 
Um, that one I know has happened a handful of times, but yeah, I think that's kind of what I would do. Um, I'm curious if other people have suggestions. Or what did you do in that moment? <laughs> or is it still broken? <laughs> <laughs> like I ended up just rebuilding it because I felt like, okay, so once I applied the, the um, control visibility using value, mm -hmm. and then when it was not that case, it, it just, I it lost it. So now I couldn't switch, even though my parameter would let me still toggle the display uh, of that other zone or whatever oh, you want to call it, just wasn't there. And I, yeah. I didn't like, well, where did it go? I was, you know, before I just brought everything together, it was yeah. working individually i guess and then i brought them into the same container like how you yep. looks like it's overlaying now you know so yeah something happened and okay. I, w I had lost it somehow or maybe so maybe it was just yeah perhaps in the wrong container um, i don't know that one actually i think something else that could happen because you can apply it at the container level because you have multiple containers in there i could see accidentally applying competing uh, conditions for like a child and a parent container so that the child container I might have that set to show but then on the parent container it's set to hide and so the top container would be hiding even though the inside one would try to be showing so I could see that happening because then it would almost always be it would never show because if you said okay show then the parent container would show, but the child would hide. And then if you said, okay, well, hide, the child container would try to show itself, but the parent container would be hiding, so you wouldn't be able to see it. So I could see that. Um, so I guess with that one, what I would then do is I'd probably just scrap it and start over. <laughs> or as I'm clicking through my different containers, I think I would just instead of resetting the whole dashboard, I think I would just reset the, like this toggle and just turn it off for everything so that I can kind of do like a sanity check and just be like, okay, is everything out here? <laughs> it should be, but like, is it? And then that's kind of how I would go. Yeah, that's a weird one though. And I'm sure frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Okay, other questions? Uh, while I have a captive audience, uh, we at Play Moran have been developing a self-paced Tableau training program that is eight, nine, nine modules, um, where we create, uh, we've created a, uh, just kind of like a learning management well, we didn't create the learning management system. We're using a learning management system. Uh, but we created these modules uh, that take users kind of through, not the whole gamut of Tableau, because that's probably impossible, um, but through a wide range of concepts, skills, and best practices. And so with this uh, training program, what we do uh, is we've kind of split up into like a show, tell, and a do kind of approach. Uh, so I have recorded hours and hours of videos of me walking through different concepts like dynamic zone visibility, sets, set actions, even think, simple things like creating bar charts, creating KPIs, like formatting trend lines, things like that. So we have all these videos, but then we also have paired those videos with corresponding Tableau workbooks. And within each one of those workbooks, we have the finished and completed kind of visualization complete with like the step-by-step -step instructions. And then it links to a blank worksheet where you then get to go and build kind of the same thing that we just talked about. So you get to see how it's done, like a video of me walking through it. You get to see the step-by-step -step instructions of what the completed visualization looks like. And then all in the same space, you then get to actually go and create the visualization. Um, we've partnered with, uh, Colorado Office of Information and Technology, I think. Oh, I, I just 
always say OIT, so I never actually know what it stands for. But um, so we are using, we're calling it like citizen data at the moment. Uh, and so the citizen data is just, um, we do like energy prices across the state uh, for uh, the last like 20 years. We're looking at income, uh, like median household income by county over time, population projections, um, food stores, like farmers markets. So we kind of use a lot of the publicly available Colorado data sets for it. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, because it is a, typically how we do our trainings is we do like small kind of in-person trainings, which can be very useful, uh, but there are times where that's not very helpful because it, you know, very few of us have days like this that we can all sit in a room and kind of take time out from our actual jobs. Um, so we've developed this self-paced option so that you would be essentially just buying a seat in the room um, and then that seat would be for six months to like 12 months where you then just get to walk through these modules um, kind of at your own pace. You get all the, the resources, the workbooks, access all those videos. Um, so if you're interested in something like that um, for like your own development, uh, if your team, if you have people that are wanting to kind of strengthen their own Tableau development, um, let me know. Um, I'd be happy to at least demo it for you and just give you a sense of kind of what it looks like. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know pricing about it at the moment. So if you have questions about like how much it would be, um, I don't know. But I do know we've talked about offering a discount for our specific user groups that we run. So I think we do like the Colorado K-12 and then we have the higher ed one maybe. Um, so I think there would be a discount for being a part of this group. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can let me know or uh, Stephanie Henry, um, but we'd be happy to, to demo that or walk you through that. Um, I selfishly, and uh, because it's my voice in a lot of the videos, I think it's great. Um, and uh, because I really just get to like sit there and do all sorts of fun things like this, um, I actually have learned a lot getting to make the videos because I have to sit there and think about like, why is this working? Or like, here's a specific use case of how I would do these. Um, and then we have an advanced analytics one. That's the one I've been working on lately. Uh, and that one's a lot of fun because we get to do like box and whisker plots. Uh, that's where some of those set actions are coming in. And so looking at like proportional analysis and trying to figure out of this group, like how do they contribute to the whole. Um, so it's just been a lot of fun. So if you're curious, uh, please let me know. But I'll stop pitching. And what's next? Oh yeah, next meeting. I'm not done pitching. She would not. So we're gonna do this like auction style. No. So we need um, a space, right? And presenters. Um, yeah, we wanted to discuss, so I think timing, um, we wanted to bring it to the group about if, you know, if we do want to do the next one in person or do a virtual meeting, I think that was still on the table. Yep. Um, and then yeah, topics and presenters as well. So for this, I think timing wise, we're kind of looking mid year, like January, February. Um, if there's, but just wanted to hear from the group if there's any like better or worse time within kind of a mid-year winter window. Nothing, think about it, but if, yeah, any like flags that are coming up, but we'll try to find a good date. Um, okay, so then in-person or virtual thoughts about that. In person format. Awesome. I like this format of recording it because I think I imagine people probably would see that it's like, oh, like I just missed a meeting, but if there's a, a video or recording of it and they get to kind of see what was talked about, I could see that being really useful. Another person. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, okay. All right, we will follow up with you and coordinate at the state. Thank you so much. And then has anybody been working on, so we saw a couple of the use cases that were presented today. Um, so is anybody working on or having any projects that uh, you want to, to demo and present to the group? Um, I think we had a great representation of what those, what those demos could look like and, and kind of the, uh, the feel of what those are. We would present, Jenna would, and Valen telling, <laughs> on some social emotional visits. Social emotional visits, great. Okay. Are there any other like topics or themes, like maybe you're not feeling like you have that ready to present, but that you would be interested in and we can sort of put that to the group as well? Like an example, kind of a side conversation, um, Edwin and I were talking about like parent facing reports. I don't know if that's anything others are either doing or interested in so, okay because maybe we could even do I mean we'll work it out but like round table or mm. what people are doing if we don't have one presenter yeah. so yeah so if there's topics that you're interested in we can follow up with those in d20 we're doing a lot of um, program analysis still with sped and digging into elements that we can't really get good reporting on in IC, um, caseload wise. Um, so that includes like minutes of service minutes per school, um, that breakdowns by the primary disabilities, um, what kind of SPED program they're in, also looking at um, specific, um, specific primary disabilities and and then like uh, the speech language um, impairment students, for example, um, and what were their goals in the previous year and did they meet their goals? And then what are their new goals <laughs> and with regards to just, are we, are we appropriately addressing? So we have a bunch of kids, but do they all, and they're identified, you know, they're primary or secondary, but do they have goals that match that need? Um, so just kind of really digging into the those pieces and haven't really done that before um, so interesting findings there and then it's really fleshing that out still but if there's a need to fill a spot I could show you what we're doing uh, yeah that sounds interesting and also kind of the theme of like a little bit of data validation or but almost like program validation with the data there any like tableau uh, features or function functionality type things that are intriguing to people that you want to know more about um, I guess it'd be uh, easy to put in a time for some of that kind of like hands-on tableau work where we look at like dynamic zone visibility or sets parameter actions um, anything like that Sorry to keep <laughs> throwing my hand up. Um, we don't. We haven't gone to the newer, newer version of um, Tableau Server yet. But wasn't there an option or a feature that involved no longer requiring you to create your own geo codes? You just could upload a spreadsheet, or if you had address data, it was going to do that for you. Was that a thing that I recall? <laughs> um, I vaguely remember something about that too. I haven't looked at that in a while, so I don't know okay. off the top of my head, but um, I can look into that. Okay. Anything 
Ravens. So not necessarily to do with Tableau itself, but um, it would be cool to see like all the ways or, uh, all the different districts like get their data into Tableau, all the different like data flows and see how the difference is on how we all handle that. Yeah. Because I know like we're, we're on premise and they were saying you have a, a IC hosted. I'd love to see like how everybody else hosts their data and brings it into Tableau. Maybe like even a little workshop on Tableau Prep, if anyone's using that to shape their data before they pull it in. Yeah. Okay. Is anyone using Tableau Prep? Yeah. I use it, so it's good. <laughs> um, yeah. I think a uh, like a round table around how to get data in. So I didn't know this group existed, yeah. and I was thinking about hosting something in Littleton for AC and for social emotional, just because we're looking at different visualizations. And um, so I'm just looking forward to inviting more people yeah. to the group from those other groups. Yeah, great. Um, how did you find Um, that, yeah, that is great to hear. And for those, maybe some of those here might have noticed that um, Tableau user groups like Tableau wide moved to a new platform, I think, spring or summer. Um, so an offshoot of that was I think we did lose our old mailing list, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but we are also, of course, always inclusive and wanting more people to be joining too. So tell a friend. Um, refer them to the event page um, and we will reach out and be, we'll do like a post event um, and send you info, but even send that along um, and let others know because yeah, we would love to grow the group, but um, we are kind of in a place of rebuilding our mailing list as well. So having people just go check it out and sign up on the website is great for that. Yeah, I agree. And I think kind of opening it up to the end user also, um, I think that's a lot of what we do is like geared towards that end user. Um, and so there's just, there's a lot of uh, valuable insights that I think we as the developers can get from having like an end user's perspective. And I imagine from an end user's perspective, it can be helpful to be able to look inside a little bit and be like, oh, like I had no idea that all this stuff is happening behind the, the scenes before it ever gets to me. Um, and so I could see that being kind of a mutually beneficial um, relationship for, for both sides. So even if they're not using Tableau, like as the developers, I could see them still benefiting from coming here. I guess I could ask you all as the end users, what do you think? <laughs> I love that idea. Um, I have been to several of these um, sessions throughout the years. Um, and I always just enjoy kind of taking in the information. A lot of it uh, goes over my head. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things that we did um, before uh, Michelle and I took off for the summer, for summer break, um, is we sat down with Holly and went step by step and built a visualization um, together. And then it's published, it's out there for the world. but just seeing kind of the behind the scenes workings. And so some of the stuff that you were talking about and going over today, we were like, yep, we saw that. Yep, that's, those are things we struggled with when when we sat with Holly to, to build the visualization. So, um, but if I think one of the other things that we're thinking about doing as a district, um, as part of some data literacy work that we're, we're doing, um, is wanting to audit some of our visualizations. So I don't know if any of you have done that work as far as like some of the past visualizations that you've built and um, how they've stood the test of time. Um, how many users are you looking at 
tracking in those visualizations, things like that. So if you have done that process, I would love to just kind of pick your brain because I know that's work that we've talked about doing in the future and just kind of where do we start with that? What does that look like? Um, but yeah, a lot of questions today for us were around training and things. So if, if I can bring protocols that we use and go through some of that with you, if that would be helpful um, or connect outside of this group for some of that, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, maybe like a round table on um, maintaining a clean data warehouse and best practices. Um, just because I know I've only worked um, with, with APS well, for five years, but uh, one year as a data analyst. But I know like over the years it's gone messier and I know that's caused some issues. So, yeah, I just like to see how you guys, the processes and I guess procedures that you guys uh, follow to maintain a clean data warehouse. Yeah. Nice. Cool. All right. Well, I think lunch is here. And are there any special instructions for lunch? Enjoy your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so feel free to eat, mingle. I don't think there's really anything else uh, agenda-wise, so feel free to stick around until you get kicked out by District 20. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to ask people, uh, network, get ideas, and uh, thank you all for being here. We appreciate it. <laughs>